this is the big picture, an official television report of the United States Army, produced for the armed forces and the American people. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Master Sergeant Stuart Queen. Following World War II, the major British colonies in Asia received their independence, and communists seized control of the Chinese mainland. The result was a changed balance of power in Asia. The 1st of October, 1949, has turned out to be a date of great importance in world history. It was on that day that the Chinese communists announced the establishment of their regime. The communist regime at Peiping is founded on the principles of Marx, Lenin, and Stalin, and on Mao Zedong's concepts of new democracy. When the Chinese mainland fell under communist control, twice as many communist-dominated people were added to the list as there are communist-dominated people in the Soviet Union. Little more than a year after the Red Chinese regime was established, it showed its intentions in Korea. For two years, Red China's massive armies fought the forces of the United Nations to a stalemate. While the war raged in Korea, Red China was also flexing her muscles in another part of Asia. With her support, the communist Viet Minh forces were able to drive Vietnamese and French forces from the northern half of Vietnam. Today, the Chinese Reds have succeeded in splitting Vietnam in two and have established a communist puppet government in the north. China's massive and still growing strength is felt throughout Asia. Aside from the military, it exerts political and economic pressure on its neighbors. India is the second most populated nation in Asia, the second most populated nation in the world. India follows a neutralist policy. The nation is making great strides in developing a working democratic form of government. But if it is unable to satisfy rapidly enough the needs of its people, India might well turn to the left. And this could not help but have its effect on some neighboring countries. The island nation of Ceylon, off India's southern tip, has already swung to the left. Ceylon, like India, has adopted a neutralist foreign policy. But communists in Ceylon are agitating for closer ties with the Sino-Soviet bloc. One of India's neighbors on the east is Burma. Burmese political leader Unu is a genuine neutral in east-west affairs. But he has no sympathy for communists at home. The Burmese army has fought untiringly against communist insurgents during the nine years of guerrilla warfare in Burma's northern provinces. Southeast Asia's newest independent country is Malaya. Communist guerrilla forces there have all but been eliminated. Some of the guerrillas have been seeking refuge along the Thai border a problem which is now being dealt with by the two countries. The island nation of Indonesia today is split by internal strife. President Sukarno has called for guided democracy, a concept which, among other things, would allow communist participation in government. But many elements in Indonesia are dissatisfied with this and with other central government policies, and some have revolted. The communists seek to exploit this situation. The Republic of Vietnam, of course, is strongly pro-Western. Cambodia is trying to maintain its neutral status. And Laos, bordering China, is under tremendous pressure from the communists. Even before the Indochina truce agreements were signed, it was clear that a defensive alliance was needed by the freedom-loving countries of Asia. Five nations, Pakistan, West, and East. Thailand, the Republic of the Philippines, 
Australia, and New Zealand. Joined with France, Great Britain, and the United States to form the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, called CETO. Here now to describe CETO's organization and its contribution to our mutual security program is the Commander-in-Chief of United States Forces in the Pacific, Admiral Felix B. Stump. Asia and the Western Pacific is a vitally important part of the world to the United States. Not only does this area contain a large percentage of all mankind and tremendous resources, but also it is a place where the communists are making vigorous and ruthless aggression. If this vital territory should come under communist control, the future of the United States would indeed be heavy with burdens. One of the steps which have been taken by the United States to diminish aggression in Southeast Asia and to preserve peace and freedom is to join the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, popularly known as CETO. CETO is a collective security organization among eight nations which have interests in this part of the world for the purpose of maintaining peace and freedom in the Western Pacific. CETO is a very young organization, only four years old. But the nations which belong to it are wise in the ways of communist imperialism and the slavery which always goes with it. Most of the CETO countries are thousands of miles away from America, and people here at home don't know much about them. It is necessary that every voter in the United States in our free country understand the issues which are vital to the United States. I hope today's motion picture will give you at least a small insight into those nations. In what follows, you will be introduced to five of the CETO countries. Australia, New Zealand, Pakistan, Thailand, and the Philippines. Bangkok lies on the banks of the Chao Phraya River near the lower edge of a vast alluvial plain. Bangkok is often called the Venice of the East. The city is crisscrossed by thousands of canals called Klongs. Thailand, once known as Siam, is a deeply religious nation. The majority of its people profess the Buddhist faith, which finds expression in many beautiful temples. The Thai are also proud of their traditions of freedom and independence. Lying in the shadow of Red China, Thailand is highly conscious of its strategic position in Southeast Asia. Since 1950, the Royal Thai Army has been following a program of modernization designed to increase the total combat readiness of its tactical units. Its aim is to create an effective defensive military force organized on modern lines. Today, Thailand's army is four times the size it was less than 10 years ago. Thai soldiers fought valiantly with the United Nations forces in Korea, and a regimental combat team is still stationed there today. When the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization was formed in 1954, Thailand was the logical choice for CETO headquarters. Of the five Pacific member nations, Thailand is the most centrally located. Frequent conferences help coordinate the work of the Permanent Council, which is composed of representatives of the armies, navies, and air forces of the CETO members. Under the terms of the treaty, the eight members agree that they separately and jointly, by means of continuous and effective self-help and mutual aid, will maintain and develop their individual and collective capacity to resist armed attack and to prevent and counter subversive activities directed from without against their territorial integrity and political stability. Each of the members has something unique to contribute to the mutual benefit of its partners. Beyond the defense organization, moreover, there are forces at work to promote economic and cultural exchange.
Australia has been called the world's smallest continent and the world's largest island. Its capital, Canberra, is in population one of the smallest cities in the country. It lies in the eastern mountain range and is surrounded by wheat and livestock farming country. Australia is a commonwealth. Its government is constitutional and embodies ideas found in both the American and British governments. Populated chiefly by people of British origin, the Australian way of life is essentially British. But since World War II, American influence has greatly increased. Actually, Australia is evolving a national character all its own. The country itself is about the same size as the United States. Much of it is farm or ranch land. One of the principal industries is sheep raising. Throughout its history, Australia's economy has been predominantly agricultural, with the greatest emphasis placed on ranching. Sheep growers and their families are found in most of the fertile sections of the continent. Like the settlers of the American West, the Australian sheep rancher is a hardy pioneering type independently minded and jealous of his personal freedom. Possessing about one-sixth of the world's sheep, Australia produces about one-quarter of the world's supply of wool. On the whole, Australian wools are unrivaled in quality and at times have brought unparalleled prices in the world's textile markets. An indication of the relative importance of the sheep and wool industry is seen when human and sheep populations are compared. There are approximately 9 million Australians and some 130 million sheep. 14 sheep for every man, woman and child. Because of the size of Australia and the wide variations in climate, shearing goes on virtually the whole year round. Wool is exported either raw or as Australian textiles. A constant reminder of Australia's contribution to Allied victory in World War II is Melbourne's War Memorial. Australians are as determined today as they were then to defend their country and its democratic institutions. Separated by vast expanses of ocean from the free nations of the West, Australians are sharply aware of their position in the very shadow of explosive Asia. Members of the National Service Battalions and the other branches of the Australian Armed Forces undergo intensive training so that should the need arise, they will be ready to fulfill Australia's commitments to see them. As much as any country in the world, the people of Australia, young and old, are air age conscious. At Royal Australian Air Force bases like Richmond, Australian and American exchange pilots welcome the visits of members of the Australian Air Cadets, an organization of teenage boys whose keenest interests are in the air. Periodic flights with experienced pilots give the cadets a first-hand knowledge of subjects studied in classes on the ground. Australians, young and old, possess a long history of devotion to the principles of liberty and democracy. Through CETO, they seek to preserve them and to help maintain the freedom of the other member nations. Southernmost of the Sito nations is New Zealand. Unlike Australia, New Zealand is a dominion with its capital at Wellington, a port city surrounded by sharply rising hills. The city was founded in 1840 by the first colonists who arrived from Europe to settle this island nation. Like Australia, New Zealand has a constitutional government. Its legislature consists of only one house, an elected House of Representatives. As in Australia, the leader of the majority party in the House is the Prime Minister. Education in New Zealand 
is compulsory up to the age of 15. The government provides liberal scholarships for higher education. The main source of power in New Zealand is hydroelectric. It is put to a variety of uses on farms and in industry. In recent years, New Zealand has been making increasing use of geothermal power, which utilizes the heat under the Earth's surface to generate steam power. At Wairaki on the North Island, engineers have drilled down nearly a mile to capture the energy used in creating electric power. Since 1949, all New Zealand men have been liable for a ten and a half week period of military training on reaching 18 years of age. This is followed by additional service during the next three years. And for the following six years, they remain members of the military reserves, a ready reserve of trained manpower to swell the ranks of the regular army in time of emergency. In size, the New Zealand Royal Air Force is almost equal to the army. Many squadrons fly the famous vampire jets. On short notice, these planes are ready under the terms of a CETO agreement to come to the aid of a fellow member which might be the victim of an aggressor's sudden attack. Pakistan, fourth of the five Pacific CETO countries, has been an independent, self-governing member of the Commonwealth of Nations for little more than a decade. Largest city in western Pakistan is Karachi, a well-planned port city with over a million inhabitants. Here the ancient and modern worlds exist side by side. In the bazaars are delicate ivories and embroidered brocades. Baluchistan carpets, and Sindhi glassware. Even today, the traditional snake charmer still plies his trade in the crowded marketplace. In population, Pakistan ranks sixth among the nations of the world. In many parts of Karachi, Pakistani families live huddled together in overcrowded, disease-breeding slums which have existed for centuries. But since British-occupied India was divided into the Dominion of India and East and West Pakistan, the government has made continuing efforts to provide more and better housing for the people. As a young nation, Pakistan is fully aware that its future growth and prosperity will depend in large part on today's younger generation. As a result, special attention is being given the educational system. Today, women are enjoying new educational rights too. Though a country predominantly Muslim, Pakistan is breaking with many of the older traditions of the world of Islam. Since its creation in 1947, Pakistan has tried to make the transition from a wholly agricultural nation to one with heavy industry. American aid, economic and military, has helped her toward this goal. In many parts of Pakistan, the camel still provides the chief means of transportation. The journey from the mountainous Afghan border to Karachi on the Arabian Sea may take many months. While East Pakistan's chief product is jute, West Pakistan is known primarily for its cotton, which represents the country's largest export commodity. The government's present economic policy calls for the development of large-scale industries for processing Pakistan's own raw materials and for producing consumer goods for the home market. The growing textile industry is proof that the program is well underway.
In overcoming its many problems when it was first created as a separate nation, Pakistan's principal asset was the spirit of its people. The enthusiasm which founded the nation has been rechanneled to generate strength and stability. Pakistan's national draft calls for seven years of military service. The Pakistani Navy is small but effective. Its officers and men are expert seamen with many years experience in the British Navy. Its chief job is coastal defense. It is in the Pakistani Air Force that the greatest advances in modern military defense structure have been made. A little more than a year ago, the Pakistani Air Force flew nothing but propeller-driven aircraft. Today, its Air Force has been converted to fly F-86 jets. Pakistan represents CETO's western cornerstone in Asia. Its people are wholeheartedly committed to defend the principles on which CETO is founded. The Republic of the Philippines, once an American possession, represents CETO's cornerstone on the east in Asia. Its capital, Manila, is one of the most modern cities in the Orient. Badly damaged in World War II, Manila has been rebuilt. Today it boasts many fine shops and stores. The Philippines is one of the world's largest lumber producing countries, ranking fifth in the ratio of forests to total land area. Commercial forests make up almost half of the land area of the Republic. Sugar is one of the five crops on which the Philippine economy is chiefly based. Climate and rainfall are ideal for raising sugar cane. In the Philippines, as in most countries of Asia, rice is the principal staple food. Because of work animal and machinery losses during World War II, rice production after the war was only half the pre-war level. Today's output of rice, however, far exceeds pre-war production. Fish and rice are to the Filipino diet what meat and potatoes are in the West. The fishing industry ranks second in importance only to agriculture. Nearly 2,000 different species of fish are found in Philippine waters. Although annual catches are at an all-time high, the Philippines is still obliged to import fish from neighboring countries to meet its own needs. A freshwater fish program is one of the government's answers to the pressing need for a bigger fish and fish product industry. Although CETO headquarters are now in Bangkok, CETO was actually born in the Philippines in September 1954. The Republic is one of the organization's most active members and holds maneuvers regularly. Communist agitation is familiar to the people of the Philippines. For many years after World War II, the country was plagued by red bandits called Hawks. As a charter member of CETO, the Young Republic has pledged itself to defend its own freedom and the independence of others. CETO's planners are preparing studies on the defense of the treaty area as well as mapping plans for cultural and economic exchange between the member nations. There is a common pool of intelligence information available to all the member countries. This close cooperation in peacetime helps to establish in advance the mutual confidence which would be needed for joint operations in case of war. Periodically, the member nations of CETO hold joint maneuvers to test how quickly combined forces can be mustered and delivered to possible trouble spots in one or another of the partner nations. Such exercises also serve as reminders to the people of the member nations that they do not stand alone and that their independence is protected by a multi-nation shield.
A major objective of CETO is to combat foreign directed subversion against the political independence of nations in the treaty area. In many cases in the past, infiltration and subversion have proved as profitable to the cause of world communism as outright armed attack. As a result, internal security, as much as direct aggression, has become an urgent challenge. Bound by the United Nations Charter, the Pacific Charter, and the CETO Treaty itself to uphold the principle of self-determination, CETO is constantly alert to anticipate and prepared to thwart any externally directed effort to seize or subvert any of the treaty area countries. CETO is the third link in a defensive chain which stretches round the world, from Asia through the Middle East under the Baghdad Pact, through the NATO countries and Europe, and through the United States across the Pacific to Asia. It is a natural and vital part of the free world's perimeter of collective security, and it grows healthier and stronger with every passing day. CETO's defensive military structure rests on a firm foundation today. Now, increasing emphasis is being placed on economic and cultural exchange. Increased cooperation in these areas will lead toward greater security, sounder economies, and more political unity in the member nations. CETO, in conception and practice, represents a force to fulfill the fondest aspirations of all the peoples of Asia, of all the world. It is a force promoting freedom from economic want, a force defending liberty and the independence of free nations. Present communist strategy in Southeast Asia is to undermine non-communist governments by threat and subversion. In the three and a half years since CETO's formation, the eight member nations have made long strides forward along the road to mutual security. Now, this is Sergeant Stuart Queen, your host for The Big Picture. The Big Picture is an official television report for the armed forces and the American people. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. <laughs>